Don't worry about a thing because every little thing's going to be all right. Growing up, this message was one that I got from my sister Maggie, or Muggsy, depending on how close you were with her. And it wasn't so much that she told me not to worry, it was more that she told me that I was magic, and that she was magic, and that if you were magic, you didn't need to worry about anything. <laughs> right? Yeah. And although I had every reason to doubt her sanity, as you would if somebody told you that you were magic and you knew for sure you weren't, she then began to prove it to me. I am Magnificent Maggie, she would declare to the vacant parking lot that we walked through on our way to the train station every day before school. She was a senior, I was a freshman, our mother had just died and had told Maggie that she was supposed to look after me, and Maggie took this to heart as only a 17-year-old can. She was not gonna just look after me, she was going to ensure that she weaved for me the most marvelous, magical, magnificent experience that she could muster. I am magnificent Maggie, she would declare, and I am capable of all things. And then she looked at me, pursed her lips and said, and you are, <laughs> you are mighty Mo. I tried not to look disappointed. <laughs> Mighty Mo? I sound like a sidekick for sure. Like one third of the three stooges. Mighty Mo? And it didn't hold a candle to Magnificent Maggie. And so in the end it was sort of perfect because I didn't hold a candle to her. I was a pimpled face, scrawny, pale, tinsel teeth, tweenager. Is there anything more pathetic than that? She, on the other hand, was an olive-skinned beauty who told everyone who would ever listen to her, which were a lot of people, that she was first cousins with Valerie Bertinelli, which she wasn't. <laughs> but she did look like her twin. She was 10 times more beautiful than anyone I had ever known in person and three times badder. And I was a bad kid, but Maggie was worse. And that was a good thing, because we were both really bad at being bad. She was not just popular with the boys, she was popular with everyone. Her name would ring out in the hallways or wherever we started walking, we would hear people screaming, Muggsy, Muggsy. And when we reached the train station to take the train to school together, she was met by always a small mob of fans and cheerleaders. Muggsy! She even had a cool nickname. The Del Barton boys, who were the boys who went to that school that was just for boys, we went to the private school that was for girls. They would be waiting at the train station for us with sad, sideways, strained glances towards her. She was out of their league and they knew it. She'd stand amid her admirers, lighting a cigarette, and she would begin to tell a story that I had heard a hundred times before, but like a groupie to a rock star, I couldn't wait to hear the tune again. That's right, she would nod, backstage to Van Halen. I told him I was Valerie's cousin. <laughs> She'd lift her white button-down uniform to reveal a concert t-shirt. But again, there was no need for proof. She looked like her, the spitting image. Then someone would kick off the boom box and we'd hear, dance, dance, dance the night away. And they'd begin singing and she'd lead them all in a spontaneous dance that they all seemed to know all of the moves to. Then the Erie Lackawanna train would pull into the station, this old train coughing and spitting like a sick old man. It would come to a stop with one long moan and we'd climb aboard this metal man without a bit of sympathy for all the miles he had traveled. And I followed her, her making a seat for me in the senior section, which was unheard of. I was like an extra at the leading lady table. She seemed to have her own spotlight. She had this way of standing out like an orange in a bowl of apples. The other girls wore loafers and bright cardigan sweaters and matching ribbons in their tightly pulled back ponytails. But Maggie, she wore fringed moccasins, faded jean jackets, feather earrings, and an orange backpack, her long hair and laughter, and a cloud of cigarette smoke. I didn't know it at the time, but she was a muse. It's hard not to believe in magic when somebody like that is nearby. Sitting next to her, I felt like I was literally soaking it in. And when it was just the two of us, she would tell me everything, more than I should have ever been told at that age. <laughs> and then when she would listen, when I spoke, when I spoke, she would listen, and when I told her things, her eyes grew wide, her mouth would fall open, and she would act like I was the most interesting creature that ever crossed her path. You're a storyteller, Mighty Mo. You've got stories to tell. I digested her declaration. I weighed her words. 
tried to make sense of her suggestion, and I began to write. Our English teacher had given us a prompt to share something that had never been the same. And so I wrote a story about the ocean. I wrote it on the train to school. It just poured out of my heart onto the composition notebook that would be handed in to our English school teacher. It was about the ocean and the shore and the little bungalow that our parents had rented each summer for us. It was about the sand between our toes and how we lived in our swimwear the whole summer. My seven siblings and I slept on the open porch beneath the stars every night. It was about the lights of the boardwalk. It was about the rides at the carnival and the music and the feeling of sunburn and the sticky fingers of cotton candy. It was all about how this was, and now it wasn't. It was in my rearview mirror since the death of our mom, how we had stopped renting the Shore House and how everything had changed. And even things that I thought would never, ever, ever change were suddenly, suddenly changing. It was so cathartic for me to write the story. I was sharing something that had been weighing on me. It was like opening Pandora's box, except although I was sharing what was so heartbreaking and sad, it also felt kind of hopeful because I got to string it together with prose and poetry that I didn't even know that I had hold of. There was hope in the simple fact that I was able to write about it, or write about this time that I was falling apart. And just in the ability to write about it told me that I hadn't actually fallen all the way apart. And that was a realization that stood me still, that I could do that with writing. See, I'd never attempted to tell anyone this story or what it felt like to have my heart shattered when my mom died because I never could imagine that I would ever actually capture it in words. But I did, and I knew that I did. And because I had written this, I felt kind of healed. It was the first time that I received an A in English, a big, fat, red A, just like you see in the movies. <laughs> It sat on the top of my essay like a bold valentine, a big, fat, bold, red A. I was dyslexic and distracted, a, a kind of student, and A's were not in my wheelhouse. And because it was so rare, I celebrated it, like a rookie getting his first touchdown. Like, I celebrated it like you do when something rare and wonderful happens, like Christmas or seeing a rainbow or the first visit from the good humor truck. I had no game page. <laughs> I danced, I pointed, I squealed. This show of enthusiasm was way too much for my teacher, Mrs. Angelo. I got an A! I got an A! She mocked me in this cruel voice, and I froze, and I deflated, and my cheeks burned, and my heart sank, and I closed up. I shut down. I didn't know a person could shut down like that, but I did. And that moment seemed to last forever. It was this thick silence that washed over me and weighted me. Her caustic comment proved what I had always known. I was in some way undeserving. And it wasn't the grade that I cared about. It was that I had told a secret, a story that made my heart stop, a story that had threatened to level me. And someone had said, good job. Even if they ripped it away from me, it was still there. I still had the proof in my hands. I still had an A. And although her mockery tainted the moment, I had a glimpse of what it felt like to be heard, to be seen, to celebrate my words and my story. That A did something for me. Under every laceration, there is this opportunity for liberation. That A stuck with me. It impacted and informed my life, which was to honor stories. And even to this day, I feel a rush, a wonder, a wordless experience that sets me still when I see the small, subtle ways that storytellers light up when they begin to find their voice and their stories and their truth. This, this moment is breathtaking to watch as the lights go on, to watch somebody timidly crawl to their own spotlight. It's magic. It's, it's creative crack. <laughs> I can't get enough of it. And every time I see the earnest eyes of a new storyteller, I remember how proud I was about my beach story. I was so proud that I read it to all of my sisters, to my friends, to my friend's sisters, to anyone who would listen. And they all seemed to like it. I never shared the part about the teacher mocking me because that was, that was my story and I didn't have to let that smackdown usurp the beauty. I got that idea from my sister Maggie too. She had told me 
prior to that, when we walk through those parking lots, Maureen, shit's gonna happen, it happens to everyone. But you always have to go towards the beauty, lean towards the light. Thank you. Woo!